you have to tell me when people are here and when to get started, William. Okay, we've got about growing fast, 15 people in so far. Hi, everyone. We're just gonna get started on Facebook. Give us a second to set that up. Well, you'll tell me when to start and when people are he all here because I can't see anything. Yeah, let's give it another 30 seconds. So we can set up Facebook. We've got about 40 people in so far. Good evening, everybody. We're just getting Facebook and things set up and then we'll get started. It's great to see you, although I can see absolutely nobody for some reason, but i um, glad that you're here tonight. Julia, can you see that I just launched the poll? Yep, you know, we're, at, we're waiting for people to join us. We're starting this um, first poll. Uh, for those who've been here before, this is kind of a standard question we ask first, what type of disability does your child have? Um, should we start, Lilia? We are live on Facebook, yep. So good evening officially, everybody. I'm Julia Landau, an attorney for Mass Advocates for Children. And I'm really pleased to be here with you tonight. Thanks for filling out the poll. There will be some other polls throughout. It seems like we have a pretty good mix of different types of disabilities. We can leave this on, I guess, for a little bit as more people are coming in. Um, we're joined tonight by Lilia Malekshi and Joanne Pino. And um, Liza Hirsch, another attorney from MAP, will be joining later on the evening to help answer questions. And I'm not sure if she's on yet, but Leslie Lockhart, who is our helpline coordinator, is on or will probably be on soon. And we kind of want to dedicate, not that this chat, but um, just really take this opportunity to thank her because she is retiring at the end of this week. She has been helpline coordinator, coordinator extraordinaire and has helped so many families over the decades that she's been at MAC and she's gonna be sorely missed, not just by MAC, but we know by all the families um, that she's helped. So thank you, Leslie. And here we are in November. Um, and I have to say, in, I don't think we're really in the position where any of us had wanted to be in terms of special ed services during the pandemic for students. We realize that things, you know, more than seven months since um, everything shut down are much more difficult for students and their families than we had hoped. Many, many students are not getting all their IEP services, whether what's being offered is remote full time or some hybrid in person services. And we know you have a, a lot of questions and concerns about what to do. We want to hear from you tonight. We want to hear your questions and your concerns. And um, we want to address your questions with the answers we have. And we also want to learn from each other as well, if you can share your ideas in the chat. Um, I have to acknowledge that a lot of the answers during the pandemic are inadequate because there are steps that parents have to take that will take time. Services should improve more quickly. And we know it's always too slow when your child's progress and um, many cases regression is at stake. Um, a few housekeeping things. We are gonna be recording. We'll finish up at a quarter of nine for people who need to leave then, and but we can stay on for questions until nine if folks wanna stay longer. And Lily, do you have a few more things for folks on Facebook? I do. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Welcome back to our regulars. Um, first, I'd like to share about our event Overcoming Together on November 18th at 7 p.m. Tickets are now on sale for that. Uh, the, the event will be completely virtual, but seats are limited and they're going fast. So be sure to get your ticket um, and I'll drop a link for that in the chat and in the comments on Facebook. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from some of the families that Mac has helped, as well as some big name speakers, and we'll be announcing those soon. So keep an eye on our social media and your inbox. Um, so for tonight, we'll be pausing throughout the presentation to take your questions. Please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen if you're joining us on Zoom. Those of you on Facebook, please submit your question as a comment under the live stream. Um, and Christina Perez will be there to facilitate your questions. If you see someone else's question that you'd like us to answer, please make sure to give it a like. 
um, and keep an eye on the chat box in Zoom and the comment section on Facebook for resources that we'll be sharing throughout the presentation. Thank you. Great, so let's jump in. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so some of this is gonna be an overview of information. Some of this might be newer, will be newer information for many of you. But um, what we're gonna talk about generally, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard or read on paper, but it's a bigger problem for many students to make it actually happen, is that as of now, according to um, the federal government, the state government, all the policies, you know, we know we have really strong special ed laws at the federal and state level. The federal and state governments, including the Federal Department of Ed, recently issued new guidance last month, reiterating that students should still, no matter whether they're remote or in person, be getting all of their IEP services. Um, things are expected to be more robust than they were last spring. I think it is for some students, but not for, sadly not for all. And that's really what we want to talk about is um, the problems that fa families are facing and to talk about what the different steps are that families can take moving forward. And I'm sure there's some success stories that we'll hear about as well, we hope. Um, we know that parents as schools hopefully will be increasingly offering more in-person services. It's still uh, the parent's decision and choice about whether it's not safe for your child and your family for them to be attending school in person. And if you feel like your child needs to be um, remaining at home for the safety of your family, then that's your choice. And all IP services still need to be implemented at home according to the law and the policy guidance. And of course, during the pandemic, health and safety have to remain the priority as districts work with you to figure out how to fully implement your child's IEP services. So um, these are the basic principles. And I think you know, the task ahead is for those students who aren't really still getting all the services, how do we make that a reality? Um, so I don't know how many of you have received yet what is the state is calling a COVID-19 special ed learning plan, but this is different from the remote learning plan that many of you received last spring. Um, and every family is supposed to have received by now in writing a description of how your child's IEP is gonna be implemented differently during the pandemic. So we have this polling question of to see how many of you have um, received a COVID special ed um, learning plan at this point. And again, the what of the IEP services should not be any different because of the pandemic. You know, the district cannot um, make a change and say, well, yes, you have, your child has a one-to-one -one dedicated paraprofessional, but they're not gonna be receiving it during COVID-19. The, the services, the instruction levels are supposed to be the same, but the plan is supposed to say how um, and where and when the services will be provided. So it looks like about a third of the families have received a plan, um, about 40% have not, and about a quarter have received something, but with not all of that required information that we were just talking about. Um, the other thing that should have happened by now, but I, I will, I'm sure we'll hear in questions whether this has fully happened, is that somebody from your child's IEP team should have reached out to you to get your information and input Put about how your child's experiences have been during the spring and the summer and the beginning of the fall with COVID. What was working in terms of remote learning? What was not working? Has your child made progress? Are there specific areas that you're concerned about or regression? You as being on the front line with your children all these months have so much information and the school district was supposed to first talk to you as they developed a plan for how best to provide IEP services differently in a way that meets your child's needs during the pandemic. If that hasn't happened, then there's still opportunity for you to give that information to your team. And this district is supposed to be setting up some process so that there's regular ongoing two-way communication with you and your team because you're still gonna be on the front lines. We know the numbers are ticking up that um, school districts that were planning on opening uh, in-person services, or many are postponing those dates, 
or um, even closing the options they had for in-person learning. So we know that families are still gonna be um, bearing a lot of the responsibility for making sure that your kids are getting what they need. Um, and, you know, one thing to emphasize in every step of the process is that all the communications are required by many different federal and state laws to be in the parents' primary language and home language, which is so critical in terms of making every step of this uh, pandemic education process work for families. Sorry, trying to make this turn. Um, so we're going to talk first about more about going into a little more depth about in-person learning and Lily will tell me where there's some questions we should jump into and then we'll talk more about the remote learning. Um, some school districts have started hybrid, um, you know, part-time in-person and part-time remote learning for all students. Other districts have started some in-person learning only for high need students. Some districts are still only remote learning and there's no in-person services offered even for high needs kids. And so we kind of want to, well, I'm sure we'll dig deep with the questions with some of those different examples. But as um, probably most of you know, the state has been repeatedly clear that the district should be doing everything they can to provide as many in-person options as possible for all students with all different types and levels of disabilities. And that if they're not at a point because of the health and safety issues that they can do that for all students, that they need to first prioritize the students that are considered high needs. And I know we've gone over this information before for those of you who were here before, but we've heard from many families that even as the districts are beginning to offer some in-person options for the families who choose that for high need students, they're not looking at this entire list and they're mostly looking at the first bullet. And so it's just, I would really want to emphasize that there's a broad range of what the state has defined as high need students. One group is the students who are identified as high needs on the IEP form that Lilia I think is going to drop into the chat box, right Lilia? Um, it's not a form that many of you may have been familiar with before, but it's a form that looks at the amount of time that your child receives special ed services and instruction and the placement and this of where those services are and who the service providers are. It's certainly meant to define students who have more significant disabilities, um, which are who are the high needs, are preschoolers. Any three and four year old is considered high needs who has a disability or students who have significant services. Um, some districts are assuming that that means only students in substantially separate programs. But there are students who are included and um, you know included for much of the day with supports, and they can also and they would also be defined as high needs if they have specialized supports that are supporting them in Gen Ed. High needs are also defined include students who are not capable of engaging in remote learning, which again might be a broader group of students than those students who are identified as high needs on this administrative form. Students who use augmentative alternative communication, students who are homeless or in foster care or congregate care, and students with disabilities who are English learners. So we have been hearing from a lot of families who believe consistent with the state guidance that their children should be being offered in-person learning, their children aren't able to access remote learning adequately, and the district has not yet been doing that. So we just want to reiterate that the state guidance is very clear. Um, we've seen this before and you've, I'm sure you've seen this a lot in the press about the color-coded system the state is using and, and will be revising in terms of um, looking at the amount of COVID cases that have been reported in different communities and basically a color-coded system of um, unshaded green, yellow, and red. And we know the numbers are beginning to rise really significantly in Boston and other areas in Massachusetts around the country. So we have clearly more districts that are in the red at this point. 
So what we really want to spend some time tonight to talk about and to emphasize is that the state has repeatedly stated in writing and in their guidance to special ed administrators that solely the fact that a district is in the red does not by itself mean that districts should stop providing in-person services, especially to students with disabilities and, and students who are high needs. That districts, of course, can only provide services safely. But the state believes that in many instances, there are still ways to safely provide in-person learning, either on the school site or in the community or in the child's home for those students who can only access learning through in-person learning and for whom the family believes that that's safe. And I think there's still an assumption in many districts that if they reach certain levels, then that automatically means that there's no obligation to provide um, in-person services. And I think that, um, again, the laws are really strong, but it's, it's, you know, we talk a lot in our office that even before COVID, we have these great federal and state special ed laws, but just what's written on paper, as you know, much better than we do, it doesn't mean that your kids automatically get the services that are promised. It often is on the backs of families to do the work and the advocacy to make what's on paper become a reality. And for some families, they're getting the services they need right now. And for other families, their children are really falling desperately behind because they're not able to access what's being provided remotely and they're not able to access any in-person options. So I do think that there's a legal obligations for districts to think creatively about how to provide in-person services safely for those families who wanna take part in that option. There was um, some litigation you all may have read about in the city of Boston because um, a couple of weeks ago, an estate judge had to rule because Boston was opening up the school buildings for the high need students with disabilities. And um, the numbers reached a certain threshold that was um, addressed in the contract between the union and the school district. And the union went to court to say that it was no longer safe to provide in-person services even for the high needs kids. And the judge ruled in favor of the district. Um, and, you know, the judge interpreted the contract that the school district sh should be keeping the schools openly. And the judge really relied a lot on um, the guidance from the state about the importance of providing access for high students with significant and complex needs and students who are high needs. And the court um, looked at the health and safety guidance from the city of Boston, who had decided it could be done safely with very specific measures to address COVID transmission. Um, and then of course the story doesn't end there because things shut down for other reasons. But I think what we saw the judge do is really what's gonna be happening in every community is that what's gonna have to happen is, you know, balancing the safety issues with the health and safety issues that um, emanate from students being deprived of the services so vital to their development and figuring out a way to balance both in a way that there's a way to mitigate the harm. You know, there's obviously harm from kids being deprived of access to the services they need and nobody wants family to be harmed or teachers to be harmed by um, doing things in a way that's not healthy. So I think that balancing that we saw in that first case in Massachusetts of things that we're gonna see more of over time. Um, and obviously this is gonna be more and more important to look at creative options in the community and for families who want them for in-home services. Are there questions yet, Lilia? I can't see. Yeah, we've yet. had um, quite a few questions roll in if this is a good point to stop. Um, someone just asked for a citation for the case that you just mentioned. Um, I can send you, when I can get on my screen, I can send the case. I'll do it at a point where I can, yes. Okay. Um, our first question is, our son turns 22 in March of 2021. How do we go about securing compensatory services beyond age 22? 
Um, that's a great question. We're going to be talking about compensatory um, in a little bit later. I could flip ahead to those slides or maybe uh, um, should I do that or just, I mean, I'll just answer it generally that there's some very specific um, processes that we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail. But the bottom line is that the students, for students who are turning 22, the state has said that all school districts should convene an IP meeting by um, December to discuss your child's need for compensatory services. You as a parent can agree to do, have the meeting with um, more informally and to waive your right to a formal IEP meeting, but students turning 22 as well as other students are prioritized to have an IEP team decide the child's need for compensatory services. And we have a lot more um, information, Lily, that maybe you can drop into the chat about, you know, that Q&A on compensatory services. It's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I will put that in the chat. I'm answering your question on here as well. Um, our next question is, is there any talk about DESI coming out with a clear mandate for districts to have full day every day for special needs children? Um, it's another great question. And we can see that there's, um, you know, some mix in terms of, it looks like most um, children are getting some level of services and um, we're more in the most to some um, which is, I think, progress from last spring, from what we understand from families that we've been working with. I just blanked on the question, so sorry. You can repeat it. Uh, is there any talk about Desi coming oh, I, out with a clear yeah. mandate? Um, I think what I would say, and I would guess Desi would say, is there is a clear mandate in the law that every student um, IEP be fully implemented and they get all their services. I don't think they're ever going to come out with a mandate to say that regardless of what's going on with the pandemic and the ventilation of a building and the health and safety issues, that every child should be full time in school. Because I, I don't think they could do that in terms of the health and safety restrictions of the state and the local public health department. But they have said clearly that every district, even when they told the districts over the summer, come up with three plans, remote, um, full-time in-person and hybrid, their guidance never said those three are all of equal weight. Their guidance has consistently said the number one priority is to get as many kids in school as possible for as much time as possible. And the hope is, is that there's more testing options going on and you, and you may have seen in the press that um, the state and others are developing partnerships to provide more rapid testing for students and educators in the schools. There's some pilots going on. So the hope is that as there's more things to address what the gaps are in terms of safety, then more the requirements of the law and the preference to be in person will become more of a reality. So I don't know if that answered the question, but that's my sense of it. Thank you. Next question, does the anticipated graduation date on an IEP or transition plan mean that that is the end date of services, especially if there's demonstrated regression during the pandemic? Another great question. Um, I think this is gonna to relate to the question around compensatory services, because if a student is supposed to graduate because they turned 22 or because they've gotten a diploma and met their IEP goals and objectives, um, they still may have a right to compensatory services and compensatory services can be provided after a student is supposed to exit, whether it's because they've turned 22 or because they're younger than 22 and are ready to um, graduate. There is talk, nothing has happened yet, um, but there's been talk from some legislators and some other policymakers about whether there should be something in addition to compensatory services to provide more time for students who are exiting special education and have lost so much time. I think the state's hope was that all IPs would be fully implemented right now and that more kids would be in school. And I think with the stark realities of what's happening for some students, it's clear that many students are still not getting all that they need. And so their need for compensatory services is continuing in the fall. So I, my guess, I know crystal ball, is that um, you know, people are gonna be trying to think 
through what is fair and just, and then the question will be how to fund it beyond compensatory services for students who are, have, are supposed to otherwise exit. Okay. But one of the criteria for students who are younger than 22, one of the criteria for being ready to graduate, MCAS is not the only criteria. The other criteria is meeting the IP goals and objectives. So in that question, if because of the pandemic, the student hasn't met the IP goals and objectives, there is some case law and some precedent to say that that is a reason um, that the child isn't ready to graduate and no longer be eligible for special ed. All right, you wanna do one more question and then move on? Sure, I'm gonna have a sip. Uh, are there CDC guidelines or I guess other guidelines um, for initial assessments or reevaluations? Because there are assessments that cannot be done at six feet social distancing. Um, I don't know if there's CDC guidelines that I'm aware of that are specific for assessments, any different for instruction or one-to-one -one hand over hand teaching or feeding or you know helping with toileting. I mean I think the same um, health and safety guidelines for close contacts, close contact um, would be required in terms of PPE and other things that would be required. And there are very clear requirements around um, when educators need to be closer to students. So that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is, um, it's very different in the spring, what exists now in terms of what's possible in terms of remote assessments, what test makers have said is possible and how people are looking creatively at how to do remote assessments. So, and there are requirements in the law that um, make it clear that the formal assessments are only one piece of what should be looked at in the whole picture. So again, it's hard to know without the specific facts of that question, but hopefully that gives some guidance or some answer. I don't know if Eliza Hurst has joined, but if she is, we should um, let her in if she wants to help answer the questions. Okay. So should we keep going? Uh, yeah, I don't see her in here yet. I will keep an eye out for her. All right, and again, I can't see how many questions are in, so just tell me when it's a good moment to stop. And then We've got a lot. <laughs> We've got a lot, but I think you'll um, answer some of these. There's quite a few questions about trans. I'm so sorry, but it's stuck again. Oh, there it goes. Okay, mask. I'll try to do this quickly. I gotta watch my time. We have been getting a bunch of calls from families who have um, concerns about masks. Again, the state's been very clear that if a student's unable to um, tolerate a mask and wear a mask consistently because of their disability, then the districts have to provide accommodations. Um, they're not supposed to be requiring a doctor's note if it's a child who's got a disability and the district already has documentation through the IEP, the 504 plan about the disability. Um, students can't be required to be in separate settings because they're unable to wear a mask. Rather, the district has to institute the health and safety protocols that are necessary so that it's safe for everybody in a classroom if, if there's a student who's unable to wear a mask. Ensuring health and safety rem remains paramount. Um, students cannot be required to stay at home because they're unable to wear a mask. Clearly, um, you know, for students, some students are just going to be unable to wear a mask because they may have respiratory and other issues. Some students might be learn to be more um, tolerant of masks if it's because of sensory issues, if their team is working with them to gradually increase their tolerance to wearing masks. But the bottom line is, is there can't be punitive or um, exclusionary responses. The state encourages districts to use clear masks for students who need them, students who are deaf or hard of hearing, students with autism, preschoolers, but we just want to clear up because we have been getting a lot of questions on those issues. I don't know if you see any mask questions before I move on from the slides, Aaliyah, but I'll move as you're looking. Um, other health and safety requirements. Bottom line is whatever the health and safety requirements are, districts have to accommodate a student's disability while continuing to do everything to ensure health and safety. So one thing that um, falls into this that we've begun to get some calls about and some parents are concerned about is what about students who aren't able to comply with the social distancing rules 
or the hand washing rules or the other, um, you know, they don't have the mask, whatever all the different rules are around so, um, health and safety. And we have heard instances of where students have been um, that those difficulties have been dealt with in a punitive way or students who are um, re-entering school after all the months of being away and they've de developed um, a lot of other issues, emotional issues, some behavioral regression that's also ending up in um, a disciplinary response as opposed to using discipline the way it always should be, but including during, hand, um, during COVID of last resort. And so the state has really emphasized the importance of using positive behavioral supports um, helping students to gain the skills and gain the tolerance and not responding punitively when there's disability related reasons. And then the last thing before we talk about remote learning is um, we've gotten some calls and concerns about students who, you know, again, it's great on paper to say the IEP should be implemented, but for students who um, should be included but need need supports and services or they're full-time remote and they should be included um, and there's all and if there's only high needs students with disabilities in the school how do you implement IEPs um, and there's a lot of difficulties so that students are with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate and um, there's a lot of issues as districts you know, we can't mix the cohorts. So for students who usually might spend some time in gen ed and sometimes it's substantially separate, some families are being told that they can only um, be educated in the sub separate settings. The students who need push in services, we know that there's been some problem in getting those services and districts are trying to work or should be trying to work creatively about how to do push in services um, in a way that's safe and sometimes might be remote. We've heard from families who, um, you know, students with significant intellectual disabilities and other disabilities who are usually included, included close to full time, but they're not getting the supports and accommodations in order to participate remotely in the instruction. So they're ending up, you know, effectively excluded. So again, we know these are big issues and that um, as we mentioned, districts, need to be implementing the IEP. So even if a student is full-time remote, if they're supposed to have a one-to-one -one para, then that one-to-one -one para should be figuring out a way to support the student remotely so that they can really engage and interact with their peers in their learning. Um, but we know those are big issues, so we're welcome questions on all these things. We know that they accommodate, you know, some students are going to need additional accommodations to effectively participate with their non-disabled peers during COVID because um, the learning structure is so different, right? With the social distancing and everything that's required or the learning is so unbelievably different remotely. Uh, we also believe like we talked about with the districts that are in the red districts that districts um, have an obligation to look at how to offer work with community settings to provide more inclusive options and learning options for students in a way that can be safe. Um, that's particularly uh, true, but not exclusively true for three and four year olds who are supposed to be in an integrated preschool class. Um, and, and if the district isn't able to establish a classroom that they run themselves that has non-disabled and disabled peers in it, then the state has said that they should be looking at um, Head Start and other and private preschools and other community settings to pro try and provide the supports in an inclusive setting in a way that's health, healthy and safe. We do so have some you. questions if we can pause here. Yeah, because then we'll go on to remote learning. Okay. Uh, my son has a one-to-one -one aid and pre-teaching by the special education teacher before inclusion time clearly stated in his IEP. However, he's remote due to our specific family situation. He is not receiving these services remotely as per his IEP. His teacher says she is too busy with in-person teaching to pre-teach him and the aide has to work with several students remotely. Uh, should we address this with the team? 
That's a great question. And um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I don't think that, that situ you're not alone in that situation with having services that are clear in the IP that aren't being provided. Um, our suggestion would be initially, and again, our health line, uh, we can provide information about how to do this. But if you've already communicated your concerns to the team member, then you could write an email or a letter to the special lead director or the superintendent. Just the way it was described in the question is really very clear that what's being offered is limited um, based on the availability of services, right? Not on what the child needs to be able to effectively participate remotely. If that does, you may have already done that, and if that doesn't um, resolve things, then this sounds like the kind of thing where a family, and again, our helpline could help you, could file, um, and you could let the district know that that will be your next day step. You could file a complaint with the State Department of Education, and we have information about how to do that in one of our last slides. You could ask for mediation. You could contact school committee members. Um, if it's an issue for other students in the district, you could work with other families to try to raise these issues and these concerns, you know, with the school committee members and the superintendent. I think there's a lot of different ways that, um, and, and you know best what will work in your community. But I, I think that in some instances, without more action from families like you, it will be hard for the district to attend on how to creatively provide the services that are so clearly needed. Thank you. Um, this next person says, my son did not qualify for full-time in school because the school said he does not qualify as high needs. Now he's not doing well on the hybrid program and now he is high needs. He has demand avoidance issues in regards to schoolwork or homework. He's diagnosed with autism, ADHD, social pragmatic communication disorder. He is homeschooled one week and in school every other week. He is a school choice person. So any advice for this person? Um, again, as we were talking about two things in terms of who's, how the state defines high needs, it has a broad definition. And so maybe from what this family is saying is if this child unable to access the learning, the way it's being offered that may well fit the definition. It sounds like this family think that it does. Um, and, and again, the, the push for districts is to be providing as much in-person instruction for all students with disabilities as can be done in a healthy and safe way. So I think the next steps that, are, that um, our suggestion is to document. Um, we do have an app that we'll get to at the end that might help you to document how your child is doing in the day-to-day -day without the services that are fully implementing his or her IEP. Um, you know, take videos of how you're with your phone if you want, if you're comfortable sharing that kind of information with your team. Pull together what you can to show how your child is struggling with what's being offered. You may get information from your um, your, your, your private, from your PCP, your doctor, or from other service providers that may be working with your family or caregivers. And same things we talked about with the family who wasn't getting the supports in their IEP for inclusion. Contact your team, contact those locally, and then you can also pursue things at the state level. Um, it's hard to give specific advice without knowing more of the facts, but there really are options, although it, it, you are also stretched. You know, I know it's a lot to ask even more, and I'm just, you know, it's hard for a, I, it shouldn't be that kids are struggling as much as they are. I'm really, I'm sorry to hear um, how difficult it is. Our next question is, the district changed the wording about one-on-one -on, -one on the learning plan to read para or teacher when the IEP states dedicated paraprofessional. How can this impact services? Um, that's hard to know without, I'm because I'm like such a lawyer right now, it's hard to know without looking at the IEP and seeing exactly what's on the learning plan. I mean, generally the law is clear, the state's um, been clear that IEP should be implemented the way they're written. I guess it would depend if they're saying they're not going to provide the dedicated support or if they're offering to provide the same level of one-to-one -one dedicated support, but sometimes a teacher and sometimes a para. I could imagine a judge or a hearing officer saying, as long as they're getting that one-to-one -one support, can you really, you know, is it a, I may be misunderstanding the question, but it's a problem that it's sometimes the teacher and sometimes the para. 
or is the concern that it won't really happen with the teacher? I mean, I don't know without having that interchange back and forth. So that'd be a great thing to call the helpline about. But the general principle is that IEP should be implemented. Um, but you want to be able to show how it's impacting your child when it's not. All right, you want to do one more question? Sure. Uh, how is integrated being handled? So if a child was 75% integrated and is now placed in a sub-separate room 100% of the time, is this considered a change of placement, even if the child logs into remote integrated? Um, what goes on during COVID it does not change the placement because the IEP that's still binding is the underlying IEP, which we believe is an important protection for families because you want the IEPs to reflect what your child needs, you know, so that you don't have to re um, advocate on these issues once school's fully open. That doesn't mean, and we talked about inclusion maybe before this person wrote the question, um, they still should be offering the amount of inclusion as creating in ways that are gonna take a lot of creativity, creativity that are in the IEP. Um, they, the inclusion might happen differently, but students should not be offered only substantially separate settings if they are supposed to be participating with non-disabled peers some of the time. But that is one of the tougher nuts. And actually our next speaker in two, um, weeks, I think that's what this, I can't, I'm just blanked out. I think that's what they're gonna be speaking about. Okay. Is in, you know, how to support inclusion, how to, what are creative options to address that issue? So am I going on now? Uh, I'm gonna go yeah. a little bit faster so that I get through these and then we can do more questions, although I think I mean, I wanna leave as much time as, for questions as possible. So for remote learning, we know these are, we know that most kids are not in school full time. And so almost the vast majority of students are experiencing all or at least some of their time with remote learning. And these are some of the harder, for some students it's going great. And for many students, there are still just huge issues in terms of accessing what's being offered remotely, having it individualized to their needs and, um, making it be effective learning so the students can make progress and are not regressing. Um, and some of the issues around remote learning, you can see some of the main points here are, again, the district has to be in constant two-way communication with you with remote learning because there's no, or for whoever the caregiver is, um, if your child's in a pod or whatever, because they need to be able to communicate with the caregiver to understand what's working or what isn't working. You as a family need access to the device and the internet and the tech support you need in your primary language to be able to make what's being offered work effectively for your child. Related services, therapies, one-to-one, -one, um, all those things need to be pre-provided -pre and we know it's very uneven to the extent that it is. And clearly, as we know, it's supposed to be more robust now than it was. It sounds like in many instances it is more robust, but um, that doesn't mean that their child's IP is being implemented in a way that they can really make um, effective progress. A lot of the questions that come up around remote learning is um, how much time should my child actually be getting instruction? There are very specific rules in our state regulations about the number of hours that a child is supposed to be receiving instruction. And we've heard it's very variable how much time each day kids who are learning remotely, whether it's, you know, three days a week or five days a week, how much time are they just getting packages and activities that the parent is effectively having to teach and how much time are they actually um, receiving in instruction and services. And it looks um, that it's about a third who are receiving instruction services for most of the day. You know, you guys can see the poll as well. There's also, we get a lot of questions about I had, a, I, at the very beginning of COVID, I had to keep under thinking synchronous when, which is live teaching or asynchronous, which is basically, um, you know, it's not in the teacher and parent and child aren't going back and forth at the same time. So we get a lot of questions about how much time can, is it okay to have synchronous versus asynchronous teaching. Again, they have to be able to implement the IEP, but the state has been very clear that 
um, to the extent there is asynchronous teaching, that the child and the parent has to have access in live time with the teacher to make sure that that teaching is really working and effective. And for many students, um, they're going to need some kinds of accommodations that they may not need when they're in person in order to really engage in remote learning. And that access to remote learning is really clearly required under the law. Um, let me just go, I'm gonna go through these last slides very quickly and then just turn to questions. I'll only quickly if I can make these friggin' slides move. Don't know what makes them move or not. I just sit here. Why don't we do a question? Oh. So um, very briefly, the timelines are still in effect around initial evaluations and reevaluations and the IEP meetings. And there should, as we discussed, be IEP meetings being conducted around compensatory services, ultimately for all kids who may need compensatory services. We know there's huge backlogs and we can spend more time at this in another um, chat talking if these are still big issues for families about how districts should be working with you to figure out timelines at, that work for your child, especially those who are having initial evaluations or may have new needs because of COVID and the testing becomes um, even more imperative than usual. This is, we talked already a little bit about compensatory services. So it's by December 15th, these groups of students, the districts are supposed to convene team meetings unless you agree to do it more informally. And these are the groups of students that the state has said are likely going to need compensatory services. There are many other students who very likely might need compensatory services, but these are groups where there's kind of a presumption on the state's part, um, whether the students with complex and significant needs, preschoolers um, who had, uh, you know, haven't started on time because of evaluations and service delays, the students who turn 22, um, from March 15th to the end of December, and students who didn't receive or can't access their IEP services. We know there's a bunch of other concerns. We'll try to answer these in questions um, for preschoolers around transportation and certainly around, we talked about this last chat, how to provide transition services for the 14 to 22 year olds. And we talked some about what happens if folks turn 22. And then this just summarizes um, some of the things that we're talking about. What can you do? Contact your school district if your child's unable to access remote learning or if your child needs a person learning and they're not getting it. Document, document, document any informal or formal ways you can, what the impact has been on your child um, about their ability to make progress, their struggles, their re any regression they might have. Um, here is a link to the app. I don't know if you're going to put that in the chat also. That um, is an app you can use on your phone to keep track of what the school is offering. So you can then later look at what they've offered in terms of compensatory services to what um, were supposed to be offered in the IEP. And also for about how your child is doing. Because that information, I mean, these numbers are going up. I don't think we're gonna, I think what's happening in terms of a combination of remote and in-person and in some cases increasing remote is gonna be with us for the foreseeable future. So the more you can document what is working and not working to share with your team, the more they can problem solve with you creatively about how to better meet your child's needs. And then here's the links, you know, if you've, talk to the, you know, dealt with the principal or the superintendent and you're ready to file a complaint or mediation or hearing, the links are there and our helpline as well. And then lastly, um, just as a checklist, you know, of the different things, not that you need more things to think about as you try to get through every day, but kind of a summary of the different things to think about that should happen and um, that you may want to address with your school department. So it's, sorry, it's a little bit past a quarter of nine. I know some people are gonna need to leave, but we've got the rest of the time for questions. And, you know, we want your feedback about how much you want just, we could do a chat that's just all questions if people think that would be useful. Um, I don't know if there's a way to ask that question without a formal poll. Um, we can bring in more speakers. It'd be really helpful to know from you what you think would be most useful as you, um, continue to work to get what your kids need. So more questions. Thank you, we've got plenty. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. 
First question, how do we get around when they tell us that services were not fully in place, um, for example, inclusion support, because they were understaffed? Even now that they improve staffing by hiring a few new people, we're missing TA support in the IEP in some classes and at some times. What do we do if they blame it on staff shortage? We're doing school fully remote by choice. Um, I think staff shortages are a very real thing that school districts are facing. And honestly, before COVID, staff shortages, shortages not as acutely, but were a thing that school districts would um, often, you know, we can't provide the speech therapy in your child's IEP because we can't find speech therapists. I mean, there, there are shortages that districts have to deal with. And the law, so that's a reality, and it's more of a reality during COVID. And the law is also clear that it's not an excuse in terms of not providing what's in the IEP. Um, so I, I, again, I think the um, steps that we went through still might be effective in terms of getting a result in that situation. The other thing that we often do when we're, um, you know, as lawyers or advocates representing families, it depends on the community. We might try to identify private providers or, or, or community providers or others who could provide the service because that helps us with our advocacy to say, well, we know you don't have staff, but there are, you know, these resources here or these private providers here. Um, so it's not that they can't be identified. I mean, of course, every, everybody is worried about how everything is going to be funded right now because every, there's just so much up in the air in our country. And at the same time, kids with disabilities, this is really around equity, right? If your kids don't get the supports and services in the IEP, they are not gonna be able to access learning fairly in the same way that non-disabled kids can without the supports. So um, even in these difficult times, it's really important to push for what the law requires, even though there's these hard realities of staff shortages. Thank you. Uh, someone's asking if we can share the results from the last poll, if we can get that up. Nope, oh, thank you. Uh, next question, is a one-on-one -on -one aid in grid B considered a special service? Yes. Wow. I really <laughs> answer questions. <laughs> you I get a gold star for getting a straight yes. I need to see in the IEP, but generally the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, is the COVID plan the same as the grid? Um, that's a good question. It, it depends, it depends what the grid is, because basically what the state has done is they've developed a template that shows what information districts have to give you in what they call the COVID special ed learning plan. And at the same time, the state says, you don't have to use our form. You just have to provide that information. So you could do it in an N1, you can do it in any kind of grid you want. So what I would say back is, you know, if you look at the state's form and we can, if you call our helpline, I don't know if, if you can find it quickly enough Lily, to put in the chat. If there's information that you're not getting, then they have to provide the, the information, you know, that the state has said they need to give you the how, the when, um, the where, then they need to be giving that to you. Um, and it needs, you know, we've seen some, we have not seen a lot of plans because not all families have them yet. Some of the ones we see, look at first until you read them more carefully to realize there's a lot that's still not being um, explained to the families so that it's really hard for the families to support their kids and even accessing what is being offered. And it's also clear that there are big gaps in the day where nothing's being offered. Again, that, you know, we could probably get more information with our helpline, but I hope that helps generally. Thank you. Um, if my child needs speech and OT outside of the remote or online services, does the school pay for that or does it get applied by medical insurance? Um, that's a good question. If your child needs more than what's in the IEP currently, then the services would probably, at least for right now, need to be provided uh, provided through insurance or provided privately. Um, if you believe that um, there was an ed educational need for additional 
therapies, you could ask for you know, further evaluation and you could reconvene the team to discuss that. But in terms of right now, there's not an obligation to provide more than what is in the IEP. I hope Mr. I understand these questions, right? But I'm trying to, we have a lot, so I'm trying to get through as many as we can. Uh, if a student is a high school senior and on an IEP and wants to switch from the MCAS alt to MCAS, what is the next step? Um, great question. I ask for an IEP meeting and make that recommendation. And again, if the, the, it's up to the district and up to you, that could, if the district agreed to that, they could agree to make that change in the IEP with an IEP and amendment you know, if you agree and they agree, um, you know, without having a whole formal IEP meeting, but that would be up to you and them. But that's an absolutely appropriate thing. Um, and obviously it's sooner and later to, to ask about since it looks like as of now, MCAS will be administered in this current year, but everything's always a moving target. Um, one thing, again, I'm so sorry, I can't see the chat or the questions for some reason. I guess if I get rid of the stop screen sharing, I could. Um, but if people can just somehow more informally give feedback about um, what your preference would be in the next chat, would I mean, do you want just a strictly Q and A? Do you want another speaker? You know, <laughs> there's going to be enough COVID. We have time to do a lot of different things, so it would be helpful to get it, you know your feedback about what would be most useful coming up. We do have a request for um, a chat, maybe specifically on compensatory services. Um, and we have some good resources for that, which I can put in the chat. We have a Q&A on uh, comp services and some other stuff. Um, my learning plan doesn't address a fully remote situation. Are learning plans supposed to include a fully remote situation if and when schools have to shut down? That's another great question. They don't have to. Um, special ed directors have asked that question of the state as well, and the state has said if the district wants to, in one um, remote learning plan, describe what's now and what will happen if there is a further shutdown, might be, you know, uh, might be smart <laughs> for everybody involved to know what to expect, but it's not required that they do that. It's my understanding. If other people know differently, share it in this chat, but that's my understanding. Thank you. Uh, what do you recommend for OT services and getting them virtually? How can we get those services best implemented virtually? Um, that's a great question. And, and I, unfortunately, I would need to know more what the barriers are to them being implemented. We've heard more barriers around speech being implemented than other therapies, but I'm sure there's barriers for families with every type of therapy. Um, but it would kind of, I guess the reason I don't exactly know how to answer is that I don't know if the district is just saying, oh, we don't, which many districts were at least um, in the spring saying about uh, districts, some districts were saying they weren't going to provide one-to-one -one or group therapies at the beginning, but many of them have started to do so. So I think I have to punt without knowing more, unless you can share more in the um, Q&A why they're saying they can't do it. Uh, they're saying they can't get the kids' attention virtually, it looks like. I mean, that's a great question, actually. I think that a lot of families have for OT, for, you know, teaching, for all different kinds of therapies, is if the student can't access something virtually, is, it dis is that um, this district done with their obligation? And I think what we've had some of our different speakers have given ideas about is there are many kids who may not be able to access OT or speech therapy or the teaching initially remotely. And that that's what I guess we would suggest is that you um, talk with your team members about how to break down the skills for attending remotely so that your child gains the tolerance and the actual skills with reinforcement to attend more and more over time. And that's what the experts we've talked with have um, said is so imperative. Because if you just, so many kids can't access things remotely for various reasons. And if there's not careful support and reinforcement and teaching, then those kids are gonna be um, just even further and further behind with so much remote instruction. It'll never be the same as in person. I mean, but it should be more effective. It's almost nine o'clock. This time goes fast, at least for me. <laughs> you guys might be ready to like, 
um, call it a day, but should we do one more question and then end? Sure, yeah. And, and if I'm you really sorry we can't get all of them. Please do feel contacted to call or to email our helpline where I'm sure Lily is um, giving you that information. Yep, that's in the chat. Um, and if you have any suggestions for future chats, please um, put those in the Q&A as well, or if you're on Facebook in the comments section. All right, last question. One problem is that the schools are not categorizing all students. They are solely looking at percent time and the PL3 form. The guidance may be very clear, but the schools don't care. What can parents do? Another great question. Um, I'm gonna feel a little bit, you're gonna think I um, need more bag of tricks to give you good answers, but the guidance is clear, the law is clear, and there are some districts for a variety of reasons that aren't. I, we've heard many districts are not looking at all the, all the categories of high need kids. I personally don't know what else a, a parent can do except to go through those steps of writing to your team, writing to your superintendent, if you need to, ultimately writing to the state, you know, can call our helpline if you need to. But very often that does help to resolve the issue. It helps to raise it. It helps for them to understand um, why, you know, your particular child really is high needs and to make a change in that direction. But it shouldn't be on the backs of families, but, um, Everybody is so stretched. There are staffing shortages. So in many cases, it's that kind of advocacy that will um, help to move things forward. I wish there was an easier answer. That's why I said at the beginning, there are answers, but they're not easy answers. And they are never fast. They are never fast enough, even before COVID. And especially now when you see your kid not being able to learn, losing skills, there is nothing more frustrating to be told that um, it's going to take too long, but things can change with that kind of input. And a lot of team members really want to hear from you because when they understand better what the issues are, they can problem solve together with you. So um, thanks for staying so late. Uh, we'll see what the comments are and kind of go from there for two weeks from now. And the more we hear from you, the more we can try to figure out how to make these chats as useful as possible. So have a good weekend. Um, we will see what the world looks like in two weeks. A lot happening right now. And if Leslie Lockhart is still here, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but a big thank you from everybody here and from all at Mac for how much we're gonna miss you running the helpline and what a core element you've been of everything that Mac's been able to accomplish all these years. Kind of a sad week for us as you retire. So good night, everybody. Hope it's a good week for everybody. Thank you, Bye, everyone. Everybody. I put the uh, helpline information in the chat. If we weren't able to get to your question, you can copy and paste your question directly into the form at massadvocates.org slash helpline. So if people want to send suggestions, I'll keep the Q&A open a little bit longer. wasn't able to make it. If you've called our helpline at any point in the last 20 years, chances are you were helped by Leslie. Sure. All right. That's a wrap. Good evening, everyone. Good night. Yeah, good night.